Just that and check. Man. My name's Scott. Man, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous tonight. And, uh, well, man, is it hot in here? Is it just me? Man, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let, let me see. Um, whew, I could use some water. Let me get some water here. Oh, my, oh my goodness. Oh, hey, um, oh, I'm so sorry, man. <coughs> is, that, is that a camera back there? Are we broadcasting this? Um, I'll tell you what. Uh, let's let's open up our Bibles to, to First Berinth, uh, uh, Corinthians. I'm sorry, Cor- not Corinthians. Uh, Corinthians chapter two, and uh, wow. Put this there. Oh my gosh, my notes. Why are you laughing? <coughs> hey, I, I, thank you, thank you so much. Wow, thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you. Okay. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, listen, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Now, in case any of you were wondering, I was just uh, kidding there at that first part. I was intentionally stammering and kind of uh, stumbling and, and all that to start an important truth. And, uh, you know, some of you right now, Pedro's going, what happened to you? I was away on a vacation. He's going, man. Something very bad has happened, but you know the the thing is, it is very easy for us in our lives to put more emphasis on the messenger than the message, and that's part of what I wanted to illustrate here in just a very simple way. And if if we're not careful as Christians, what can happen is we can become critics, we can become spectators, where Christianity becomes a spectator sport, where people begin to watch and and rate and all that sort of thing and judge performance in the pulpit and say, hey. Were they funny? Was it a good message? Did I like the look that they had? Or, you know, did I like the way they did it? Are they clever? Was it interesting? Are they polished? All those types of things. And can they command the attention of people there in the pulpit? And do they have a stage presence? And I know as a pastor, sometimes, just very frankly with you, sometimes we can feel a pressure to be profound, to wow people with our words and to have these incredible insights and have people say, wow, what an intellect or what an insight that person has. And as a result, I believe many churches have, in fact, abandoned the very simple teaching of God's word and turned to entertainment centers and having that worldly wisdom and that worldly way of doing things. Now, some right away would say, well, that's a modern problem, right? Well, it's not at all. In fact, The great thing as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians is we're going to see that the first century church wasn't so different than the church today. And so the things that they learned, the things that they saw, we need to see them too. And so as we will see in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, this was a problem even in Paul's day. And most of the people there in Corinth, they cared much more about the messenger than about the message. And they put the emphasis on the way something was said rather than necessarily what was said. And so there was a lot of style maybe in some of the speakers, but not necessarily a lot of substance. And so what you see was them putting that emphasis on the world's wisdom instead of word wisdom. Having human reasoning take a greater spot in their heart and in their mind than divine revelation. And that can happen in our day just as much as it did in Paul's. And so as we saw last week, Paul began this corrective letter to the Corinthians with a, with a very simple statement. And you may remember it, it, it's one of the central verses of last chapter. It's chapter 1, verse 18, and if you have your Bible, take a look at it with me. It says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, what you see is that Paul preached a very specific and simple message. That's the message of the cross. And it wasn't a political statement so much. It wasn't philosophy. It wasn't psychology. It was Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message. And really, it's not a very complicated message in its most basic form, as you see it. It's the kind of thing that can be understood by children. In fact, 
Jesus even said, unless you become as a little child, in many ways you won't accept and understand and embrace these things. And so, over in the children's ministry, there are people explaining Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But we're just big kids here. And so here it's also Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And one of the greatest compliments I ever received as, it, as far as it came to being a teacher is I had a good friend of mine say, our family likes to listen to your teachings, and my kids really like it. In fact, they understand it. And that's when I said, hey, I think maybe we're on to something in that way. Because you know what? It may be simple enough for a child to understand when you really look at it, but it comes with the very power of God that is so great that the greatest genius in the world could not have thought of anything more profound. And so the message of the cross is something that's profoundly simple and simply profound. And so how a person responds to that simple message really says a lot about where their heart is at. And as you see, the cross being a matter of life and death in every life. And so there's a wide gulf sometimes between the world's wisdom and the word wisdom, that thing that really comes from God's word. And as you think about that gap, there's a way that the world says, hey, this is right. And many times the world says, oh, there's a lot of ways that are right. But God's word says, hey, there's one way that is right. And the Bible even goes on to say that there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, that way is death. And so if you look at world wisdom, well, it's not necessarily going to take you where you want to go. And so we look tonight at God's word. And this chapter, first. Uh, Corinthians chapter 2, it can be divided into three basic sections. If you're taking some notes here, some contrast that you're going to see, we're going to see two different types of wisdom. We're going to see two different types of spirit. And we are going to see two different types of people. And so in those categories, in each case, there's the world's way and there's the word way. There are different ways of looking at those things, and they are going to be different. But first of all, we'll look at the two types of wisdom. The wisdom of the world, or on the other hand, the wisdom of God's word. And so verse 1, this is what it says. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we can kind of stop there in the very first part. And verse 1, Paul is saying, I did not come with excellence of speech or with wisdom. Now again, that doesn't mean that Paul was a bumbling fool. Don't get that idea as you read it. What he's saying is that I intentionally rejected and avoided the world's wisdom. I had intentionally said, oh, the super smart folks and all that, I could go that way. I could look at things that direction, but you know what? I've already been that direction, and I've found that the real wisdom lies somewhere else entirely. And so he says, I'm rejecting the world's way. I am saying no to human reasoning as the way to figure out what life's all about. And so he didn't come to Corinth to show off his IQ. He didn't come to compete in some kind of speech contest and see who could give the most incredible oratory message that had ever been given. No, in fact, he just said, I'm a simple messenger with a simple message, and this is it, the message of the cross, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, a very easy to define message there, Jesus Christ the person and him crucified, the work that he did there on the cross. And notice in verse 2, what you're going to see is the word determined. He says, I determined this. I made a decision here, a, a deliberate choice in my mind. It wasn't just something that, oh, well, I don't know what else to say, so I guess I'll just say this, or I don't know anything else, or haven't been exposed to anything else. No, it was him saying, you know what, I determined this. This is something I've decided from careful, careful consideration. The only thing I know that is worth sharing in any way is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul was well aware that this was a message that would be looked upon as foolish in many circles, that people would say, oh, come on, Paul, you can do better than that. That's for the simpletons. That's for the people who don't know any better. Isn't that kind of like the opiate of the masses and all that kind of stuff? Well, the message of the cross wasn't popular in his day, and it's not popular necessarily in our day, and it's not the world's way to win friends and influence people. But you see there in Corinth, it was a Greek city. And right away, if you think of Greece or Greek, what you think of, I hope, is not necessarily the uh, sororities and fraternities, but 
philosophy, right? Philosophy is all, all had much of its source out of there. The greatest thinkers in history, and maybe you know some of their names. But in that culture, there was a premium put on the way with words. It was somebody who had great human logic and rhetoric, someone who could explain things in such a careful way, and the speaking skills, and they had fancy words for things, and they had their perfectly timed gestures. That sort of thing, you know, carefully planned, pause here for a little laughter, you know, that kind of stuff. And so they had it all very carefully thought out. And so you see that there were even books that are still things that you could look at today from those times in which people would tell you how to wrap an audience around your finger as you spoke, how to use these different tricks of the trade and all that. And so it was accepted, it was expected in that culture that you would be a polished performer when it came to public speaking. And so the first thing that they would do is they would flatter the audience. They would say, well, you're such a learned and capable and wonderful and uh, smart audience that it's such a treat that I could be here to teach you tonight. And of course, I, being a very learned and wonderful and capable person, will impart to you my great learning and we'll all walk away a lot smarter. But here's the thing. Paul, he didn't do that. He didn't come in and flatter his audiences. And in fact, sometimes he kind of flattened them with the truth by saying, you know what, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. And, you know, that puts us kind of in a pretty low spot in some ways. And he said, I'm not here to uh, puff you up in some way with some kind of, uh, you know, feel-good kind of thing. No, Paul said, you know what, there's some stuff that we have to deal with. And also he went on to say, you know what, it wasn't him talking about what a wonderful guy he was. His experience and his influence and his education and his exploits and all that stuff. The focus wasn't on Paul in his preaching. No, again, he said, I am just a messenger here with a message. I just want to deliver this in as pure a form as I possibly can. The perfect life of another man, Jesus Christ, the perfect life, the sinner's death that he died, that humiliating thing, that thing of great shame in their society. Again, crosses, we wear gold ones, but they didn't in those days. That was a uh, an element of execution and humiliation. And so he comes to talk about this guy who lived a perfect life, lived a sinner's death, and then had that resurrection, which brought it all to a different understanding. And so Paul, as we see here, was a great scholar. He studied under a man named Gamaliel, and he was one of the most respected teachers in that society. And so Gamaliel wrote in one place that he was very impressed with Paul as a student because he couldn't even give him books fast enough. He was just chowing through them so quickly. So again, don't think of Paul as some kind of country bumpkin who didn't know what was going on. Again, he deliberately decided, no, I've searched the world over, and this is the truth in God's Word. And so you see him doing that, purposefully making his ministry not based on the power of Paul, which was great in some ways, but the power of God, which was greater still. And so you see in verse 3, he says, I was with you in weakness. I was with you in trembling and in much fear. And you think about those things. Again, is that the kind of stuff that people who want to really exude that self-confidence and, hey, I'm a public speaker, uh, I'm hearing weakness, fear, and trembling. That's, uh, I don't know. You think about a shaky voice, maybe some knocking knees and the pulse racing and the notes on the floor and all that. Is that what comes to mind when you think of Paul? Well, maybe it should be a little bit more because he, by his own admission, says, you know, this isn't something I did with great self-confidence. This is something that I did fully relying on God. And so if you think about it, sometimes we think we're the only chicken in God's coop, right? That we, everybody else is real tough. Everybody else never worries. You know, Pastor Pedro, of course, he gets up here and it's just smooth sailing. He never has a struggle, never has a fear, never has a doubt, never goes home and beats himself up and says, man, what in the world was I saying when I couldn't pronounce that or whatever? You know, we think some of the times that we have those things and everybody else is just so confident and we're so chicken. But you know what? You think about it, God has a long history of using people who had many inadequacies. You think about it, Moses himself said, you know, but God, I can't speak. You know, And so God says, I made your mouth, Moses. I can help you with those things. And you see Moses becoming one of the greatest leaders that the world has ever known. And so I, I think sometimes people are surprised when we maybe admit some of our inadequacies. And I, I, adequacies, and I always 
am quick to tell people, you know what, I don't do this because it's what I always dreamed of doing. And I thought, hey, you know what, I'm going to be a public speaker someday. No, if someone had asked me, what's the least likely thing you will ever choose to do, it would be stand before people and speak. Why? Because I'm, I'm actually phobic of sp public speaking. I actually have great uh, anxieties that surround those types of things. And so many people say, well, Pastor Scott, how could it be? You seem so calm. You seem so confident. Well, you can't see my inside right now. You know, right now my stomach is doing things and it's shaking all over on the inside. You know, I learned to turn the shakes inside. That was real helpful. And, and so before teaching, what I do is I, I usually don't sleep very well. I'm just letting you know, you know. I don't sleep very well. I don't eat. I never eat before teaching. Why? Because I learned that lesson one day and I said I'll never do that again. <laughs> And see, there's a little room back there, and it's called the prayer room, and a lot of people pray after the service back there, but you know what? We pray before the service. Why? Because all of us do what we do with some fear and trembling. And the longer I teach the Bible, what I've found is the harder it gets, not the easier. And you would think, oh, man, you do something enough times, it gets easier, doesn't it? But remember, this isn't just like talking about, say, you know, computers or sports or music or some topic that I just picked, that kind of thing. No, the longer I'm a Christian, the more I really realize what it is to stand here and teach people God's Word. What it is to say, you know what? Uh, Thus saith the Lord. And this is what God is wanting to do in our lives here collectively. And so the longer I'm a Christian, the longer I'm a Bible teacher, the more of a weight I see with those things things, the more I understand in a little way what it is to say, you know what? <laughs> I'm speaking for God. I'm speaking of Jesus. And who am I to do that? You know? And so you think about it, the hardest part of preaching isn't, isn't just the talking part. It's actually practicing what you preach and going through the lessons that you learn through those things. And you know, uh, one of the examples we like to use around here is, hey, where God guides, God provides. Now that's a cool saying, if you've never heard it before, now you have, where God guides, God provides. And if you say that, people think, man, what a spiritual guy. Now, you can learn it quickly. You already know it, right? Where God guides, God provides. Hey, we can say that. I can go teach it on my, uh, you know, Bible study at work if you decide, you know, where God guides, God provides. But here's the question. Can we live it? Can we believe it? Because as God has made very clear to me at various times, you know, if you won't live it, I won't let you say it. I'm not going to let you stand there and say it if you won't live it. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to give you some trials and temptations and difficulties and challenges in that so that you can say it with confidence and with clarity, knowing that God does do what he says he will do. And so I believe Paul was trembling, not because he was necessarily nervous just to talk in front of people. It was because he knew that if God did not show up, he was sunk. You know, Paul was in a position where, you know, he, as he went around doing different things, if he had not had God show up, he was in a lot of trouble. And he was in a lot of trouble even when God did show up. But the thing was, the message of the cross was not a popular one. And it divided people. You know, here's Paul talking to the Jews about the fact that, hey, they crucified the king that God sent. And in fact, hey, you know what? You need to become as the Gentiles do, believers. There is no special favor anymore. This is going to be something that, you know, Paul was able to say it. He used to be a Jew. And so he says in those things, you know what? There's a murdered Messiah, and we messed it up, and we all need to come to him. And that was a message that ha brought some open hostility. He was jailed and he was beaten. And so you can picture Paul kind of before every lesson, again, going, <sighs> Okay, God, here we go again. I really need you to show up for this one because the last time, you know, that beating hurt pretty badly. And I'm still thinking about that one a little bit. And I'm still kind of looking around the room to see who has a stick, you know, and that kind of stuff. Who's going to let me have it after the teaching? And so you see that he says in verse 4, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the, power, of the Spirit and of power that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, this is a really important section here because remembering that contrast, he said there's the world's wisdom, there's also the word's wisdom. And Paul didn't say here that, you know, again, he didn't have any abilities to communicate clearly and that sort of thing. But what he's saying is, I didn't use those tricks of the trades. I didn't go in and try to figure out how to manipulate people through what I was doing because the reason that he was preaching was not to get people to trust in Paul or to follow Paul, but to follow Christ. And so he knew, hey, the more 
I shine sometimes, the less God shines. And sometimes people will say, oh, that guy's an incredible preacher. But you know what? A real incredible preacher will leave people saying, God is an incredible God. Not, that guy's an incredible speaker. Because ultimately, that's where the attention should go. And so you see that Paul was doing that, and he was, he was not wanting their faith, faith misplaced. He didn't want them to have a faith that was based on human reasoning and then on a human being, because he knew that that would fail. And so we need to ask that question sometimes. Hey, where is my faith? Is it in the right spot or is it in the wrong spot? And if you're putting it in philosophy, if you're putting it in logic, if you're putting it in human reasoning, however smart some of those people may seem, you know what? Persuasive words can sell you almost anything. And I know that because some of you have an abbasizer in your closet, maybe even two of them. You bought one and then they sold you another one, you know, for three easy payments. And you go, well, how can that be? Nothing easy about the payments. And so you see in those things that those who study human behavior, those who look at these things carefully, as advertisers do, they know how to make us, get us to make decisions. They know how to get people's emotions moved and that sort of thing. There's a lot of little ways to hook folks in those ways. And Paul knew those things in many ways. He knew it's possible for people to have a faith in Paul without really having a faith in God. But as long as Paul was there persuading them and really pumping them, then they would be fine. But as soon as Paul left, their faith went with him. And you see those things, he realized that. And he said, you know what? If I can argue them in, someone else will come along and argue them out. So I'm not going to waste my time trying to argue people into the faith. What I'm going to do is live a life of faith in which the demonstration of God's reality is so apparent in my life that if somebody looks at it and they're honest, they're going to have to admit it, that God is real. And so you see that he determined, I'm not going to use fancy footwork. I'm not going to have these great sales pitches. I'm not going to use manipulative techniques. I'm just going to let God's word does, do what it does does what it do. When you look at these things, no great arguments there, but intellectual arguments, see, they can't shake the faith of a person who's personally experienced the power of God. If God has changed your life, nobody's going to change your mind by some new discovery, supposedly on the Discovery Channel, that they found somebody's bones, and his name was Jesus. Well, I know guys right here in this town named Jesus, and we found his bones. So what? Here's the thing. The blind man. You think of this in, in uh, the New Testament. You see Jesus healing a blind man, and the Pharisees, who were great scholars, great intellects, came over to the guy and said, you can't possibly be seen because, see, Jesus is a really nasty guy, and he's a fraud, and he's claiming to be things that he really isn't. And the guy said it so great. He said, look, <laughs> that's for you scholars to debate. I don't have any idea. I'm just a simple blind man. But I know this, I used to be blind and now I see. And they go, <clears throat> you know, and they go off for the little arguments. But there's really nothing that could be said. Do you think that man, if he were to, you know, be blind and now he sees and he's looking through the paper and he sees some scientist who said the Bible can't be trusted or Jesus isn't real, he's going to go, <gasps> oh no. He's going to go, come on, man. My life's been changed. I know what I know. The power of God. My words can't change anyone, but you know what? God's word can change anyone, and it will. And God's truth is never made stronger by mixing it with something else. You know, a lot of times we think, oh, okay, well, we'll mix in a little human wisdom in there, and then God's word will really be strong. Well, that's kind of like mixing a lot of water into some tang to make it stronger and stronger. No, pure tang is pure tang, baby, and the more you water it down, well, it's still pretty powerful stuff, even watered down. And so there's some things that only God can do. And you think about it this way. I read this story a while back, you know, and uh, Dr. Billy Graham's been in the news a lot. But he, he was a guy who, you know, traveled a lot. And there was a time when he was on an airplane. And a guy came up to him and said, Dr. Graham. I'm one of your converts. And the guy was visibly intoxicated at the point. You know, and he's, Dr. Graham, so good to meet you. I, was, I came for a crusade. And this is what Billy Graham said to him. You may be one of my converts, but you'd better make sure you're one of his. Wow. 
That's pretty insightful. Here's an evangelist who knows this very clearly, as all good ones do. You know what? There's a difference between an emotional response in a moment and a real-life change. And thank God Billy Graham knows the difference, and he's brought about incredible numbers of real-life change. But he knows as well as anyone does that, you know what? Sometimes people are just making an emotional response in a moment. And there's a huge difference between those things. And so you see life change so important in our lives to really look at it and say, hey, the word of God changes our lives. This is what really makes a difference. You think about John 21. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And there you see Peter went fishing. And it was a failed fishing trip in a sense because he didn't get any fish. And so he fished all night, you know, and didn't catch anything. And then you see Jesus coming in the morning and saying to him, Little children, now anytime you've got fishermen and, and they've fished all night and they haven't caught anything, you're kind of toying with them. To, hey, little kids, catch anything, you know? And he says that to them and, and they're kind of whatever. And then he says, I got a suggestion. Why don't you throw your net on the other side of the boat? Now, this wasn't a big boat. Don't, don't picture the Queen Mary or something. It's massive. I mean, we're talking a little bitty boat. We're talking a few feet on the other side. And they do what he said and they haul in so many fish they can't even bring them all in. And it's great because Peter doesn't put out a book, you know, well, all that I learned about fishing. No, he says, it's the Lord. And he dives in and he swims to the Lord. And you see that in our lives, that when, when our lives are lived correctly, I believe, people look at our lives and they're not going to say, wow, you know, it's the Scott. He sure is smart. He sure has worked everything out so well. And you just look at it and go, man, it's the Lord. When we look at this church, we say, it's the Lord. Now, does that mean that we're not diligent in doing whatever we can do and, and asking the Lord to direct us through his word? Of course we are. But at the end of the day, the difference between an empty net and a full one, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And so you see the world's wisdom? Hey, persuasion, polish, manipulation, self-confidence. If you believe in yourself, then there's nothing that you can't do. And Paul says, you know what? The word's wisdom is so different. The power of God demonstrated through human weakness, not human greatness. And so you see in there that it's, it's not a call to poor preaching. It's not a call to mediocre ministry. It's not saying, hey, check your brain at the door and you can't have a good IQ. No, it's the Bible teaching, hey, study to show yourself approved. Stir up the gifts that God gives and do whatever you do with the excellence as if you were doing it for the Lord and not for men. But what a freeing thing it is to realize when you say, hey, you know what? It isn't my greatness that's going to do anything great in life. It's the message itself that has power. See, we can all have a confidence in the message of Christ, even if we don't have a lot of confidence in the messenger ourselves. And so the world looks on and says, hey, that's foolishness, but we know better because he says in verse 6, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. So what he's saying there is, you know what, the really impressive people in this world, they're not really that impressive when you look long term. When you look at the end of the story, verse 6, you see there it says they're coming to nothing. And maybe you recognize, recognize the name Voltaire. Some of you say, I have no idea who Voltaire is. Well, that's just proving my point in a way. But he was one of the great thinkers of the 1700s. He was a French philosopher. And he said that the Bible will have faded into obscurity in my lifetime. They, he was one of the great movers in the age of enlightenment, but really it was the dark ages spiritually. Because you see, there were so many who say, oh, only foolish you know, uneducated people could possibly believe the Bible. And here's the funny thing. I think God has a great sense of humor. After Voltaire died in his house there. He was actually, his house was later sold and purchased by a major Bible publishing company, which became one of the major sources over the next centuries of Bibles being pumped out of the very place of the guy who said, oh, the Bible won't even be around long after I'm gone. So I imagine more of you in this room are reading the Bible, and there's a reason we're not studying Voltaire tonight. But you see, Verse 7, it says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, seeing right there, what you see is that it's, it's a mystery. 
It uses that word in verse 7, a mystery, a sacred secret, if you will, something that was once unknown, but now it's been revealed. It's not that it remains a mystery. God has solved this mystery. How? Christ and him crucified. What was the mystery? Well, the Bible says all throughout that there was going to be a guy who would come and he would be a savior. He would be a king, but he would also be a suffering servant. And there are all these puzzle pieces prophetically that you said, how could this possibly all add up? But you see, it was ordained before the ages, before the world ever existed, with all its so-called wisdom. God's word existed, and the cross was not plan B. That's what it's saying here. It was ordained before the beginning. The plan of God for salvation has always been and always will be Christ and him crucified. But there's a way in which it's hidden. It even says that there, the hidden wisdom which God has and has ordained. Now, how is it hidden? Why is it hidden? You know, people say, doesn't God want people to know the truth? Oh, yes, there's nobody who wants to know the truth who will not know the truth. See, Jesus said in Luke 10, 21, that the truth is hidden from the proud, but God reveals it to babes. Those who are willing to humbly receive it will receive it. Those who want to be puffed up in pride, well, they won't receive it because it's fool's wisdom. See, when I admit I'm a fool... Finally, well, it's amazing how much God will reveal his wisdom to me and to you at that point. See, when I realize I know nothing, in spite of all my education and experience, I know absolutely nothing about how to live life apart from God. You know, he gives me everything of how to live a godly life and a meaningful life. And so God, he came to this earth as a man. That's Christ and him crucified. And the great rulers of the world, the very guys who knew the Bible backwards and forwards, you know what's funny about it? Well, they didn't understand it. And you see the Roman rulers who were supposed to be the best and the brightest and all that kind of stuff? Well, you know what? They missed the Messiah too. And so God was right there in front of folks, and they missed him. Just as the Bible had predicted, and they crucified Jesus. But that was part of God's plan. But you see, it was still a hidden thing that's revealed now for our glory. And so you see it written, eye is not seen, verse 9, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now this verse also, one of the great verses of the Bible, eye is not seen, ear is not heard. There's so much that God has for us. But you hear it a lot uh, at funerals, you know, in the context of heaven. It's sort of like, okay, we haven't even seen what's coming. The best is yet to come, and certainly that is true. And, and, you know, if you've ever had this concept of eternity that you're going to basically be playing a harp, you know, bling, bling, for all eternity. Talk about boring. No way. That is not what it's about, folks. If that's your idea, uh, well, you need to change your idea. You know, the heart has not even thought of what God has in store for us. But if you look really closely, Paul's main point, is really not about heaven. It's about the here and now. And the fact that actually, the things that we can't physically understand, God has revealed to us in a different way. Verse 10, it says, God has revealed them to us. That's past tense, through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of God, or spirit of the man which is in him, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, what you see in here, in many other places in the Scripture, but God is one God in three persons, and you see that is something that human logic wouldn't reveal that to us. It also will not be able to really reconcile that in your mind. You know, how can God be three in one? Well, He is. The Bible says He is. And God's Word reveals that. But you see, one of the persons of the Spirit... Or, or, or of God, is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And so the pronouns that are used in the Bible are so very clear. It doesn't speak of the Spirit as an it, but as a he. He, uh, Jesus said, I will send him to be inside you. I've been beside you, but I am going to send the Holy Spirit to be inside you. And so you see, verse 10, the Spirit searches all things. In the Greek language, that searches all things would be used even like of a customs official, going through your bag real carefully and all that thing, searching the deep things. Now, 
I actually took a trip this last week, uh, overseas flight, and they were very thorough. You know, they look all through your bag. They search all things, the deep things even. You know, they're opening things up and looking inside all this stuff. And you see him saying that about God when it comes to spiritual things, deep things. See, again, just because a child can understand these things, Christ and him crucified, Oh, again, you could explore the depths and the glory of that for the rest of all eternity, and you will, and we will. But the world still thinks that that's foolishness. But what is going on here is it says that the Spirit of God can reveal God's deep thoughts, and only the Spirit of God can do that. Only God knows what God is thinking. And you think about it this way, very simple illustration, only I know what I'm thinking. Like right now, I'm thinking of a word but you don't know what word I'm thinking of. How do I know? Well, because if you do, go ahead and say it. Anybody know what word I'm thinking? I know the guys in the sound booth know because they have my notes, but nobody else knows. <laughs> All right, should I tell you or should I keep it hidden forever? Well, again, the point of that very simply, some of you are saying, go ahead and tell us. No, the point of that very simply is that unless I reveal what's going on in my mind, there's no way you could know it. And it's saying in the same way in the scriptures here, unless God reveals his mind to us, there's no way anyone could know it. You can't know it from the outside. You have to know it from the inside. You have to have it given to you. And here is the word that I was thinking of, revelation. The reason? Because it's God revealing himself to us through his word that actually gives us an understanding of what God is like. If not for the Bible, guess what? Every single one of us would have to just come to our own conclusions about what we think God is like. And that's exactly what our society has done. Well, throw out the Bible, and I think God's like this. Well, I don't believe in a God like that. I have a a la carte God. I pick the things I like. about. what You can't do that. The only way to know the mind of God is to have his word and illuminated through his spirit. And so we've seen already the the two types of wisdom that come, the world's wisdom and the wisdom from the word. But also here, as we're going to see, two types of spirit, the spirit of the world and the spirit of God. And so verse 12, it says, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And so what you're seeing in verse 12 is one part of the continuum there, which is the spirit of the world. Now, right away, people would say, What is that? What is the spirit of the world? Well, I think one of the best cross-references you could possibly have to this, maybe write it in your Bible, is Ephesians 2.2. Ephesians 2.2 explains very clearly what the spirit of the world is. And it says this, You once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And it says... We also once walked and conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. It talks about fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now, again, that's just saying, hey, right there, the spirit of the world is everything that's against the spirit of God. Everything that's opposed to God, either actively or even just passively. And behind the world system is a someone. Ephesians 2.2 calls him the prince of of the power of the air, and that's the devil, that's Satan. Now again, the wisdom of the world, there would be some who'd say, oh, come on, science has gone so much further than that. You don't believe there's really a little guy in a red suit, blah, 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 blah. No, I don't believe he's wearing a red suit. But I do believe in him, just as I believe in God. And God's word makes it very clear that he does exist. And by nature, by birth, you know what? Here's the problem. We do not have the spirit that is from God. I can't give that to my kids myself. I I can give them the spirit of the world, but that's about all I can give them. And so you see that we need to have the spirit that is from God. That's what it says there. And by default, we're born in sin and on the wrong side of a cosmic conflict. And whether or not we say, well, I chose the spirit of the world. No, it was actually the default. You know, you ever been on a computer and you say, I didn't pick that. Well, it's the default. That's the way it is. And so God has given us a choice to change. That's what's great. Every person gets that choice, a decision to make, which is what spirit will you follow? Will you follow the spirit of the world or will you receive the spirit of God? 
Will you continue in disobedience and lust and earthly desires and selfishness and pride? And even if it's not that horrible kind of sin that people have, sometimes the most incredible sin is self-righteousness that thinks I can be good enough for God without God. That's exactly what the Pharisees thought, and they were the ones that Jesus had the hardest time with. And so you see, the Spirit that is from God, that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, as it says in the Word of God, is given to those who trust in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Those who put their faith in the work that Jesus did on their behalf. Well, that is the way also that a person is given the Spirit of God. And you see in verse 13, it says, these things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so the Holy Spirit teaches us spiritual things. What are the spiritual things the Holy Spirit teaches us? The Bible. Now, it's possible to have a Bible without having the Holy Spirit. You know, it's possible, the Scripture scholars, there are many people who study the Bible and pick it apart and everything else. But you know what? True illumination comes in the Scriptures when you have the Spirit of God. See, I know I had owned a Bible, but when I gave my heart to Christ, it's like I said, where did this come from? Where has this been all my life? I studied it in school academically, and my, meh, 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 but all of a sudden it was changing my heart and life. Why? Because I received the Spirit of God, which gave illumination to the Word of God. And so you see in those things two types of wisdom, two types of spirit. And then in verses 14 to 16 through the end of that chapter, there are two types of people. There's really two types of people in the world. There are people of the world, and there are people who are in the world, but they're of the Word. That's what you really see. Jesus said, I'm not going to take you out of the world. I need to leave you in the world. Why? Because the world needs to see my word. That's why. Through your life. But you see in verse 14, it says, the natural man, that's the worldly person, the person who is of the spirit of the world and the wisdom of the world. It says, they don't receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, stopping right there, just thinking about it for a moment, I think this also gives us great insight and understanding, because sometimes if we've been a Christian for a little while, we forget what it's like to not be a Christian, you know, and you, you forget these things. But here's what it says here, very clearly to us, which is to receive the truths of God, to receive spiritual things, there's something first we have to receive, which is the Spirit of God. We're not going to receive spiritual things if we don't have the Spirit of God. Now, that seems a little bit basic, but that's basically what it's saying here. Unless you really feel like wasting your breath with somebody, don't try to argue moral issues and moral points with a person who really just needs to be born again by the Spirit of God. Why? Because you're arguing with somebody who can't possibly receive the things you're talking about. They can't agree with you. They can't possibly see eye to eye with you. Why? Because they do not have the Spirit. So what is the point? First things first. You think about verse 14, it's saying the, the phrase, nor can they. They simply cannot. You know, can't you understand me? No. Why can't you see why this is so important to me? They can't. Why not? Because they don't have the Spirit. And trying to get a non-believer to act and think like a believer is like trying to smell the color nine. Now, some of you recognize that from a song, and you think it through from it. Smell the color nine? How could you do that? Well, you can't. That's the whole point. It's an oxymoron. There's no way to do it. What can we do? This is the point. Live and give the gospel. Christ and him crucified. That's the solution. Because you think about it, when a person receives the Spirit, they suddenly will be able to receive spiritual things and all that goes with it. It'll change them like it's changed us. See, again, people argued morality with me my whole life from the other side, and I never accepted it until I accepted Christ. And then suddenly all those things changed. The power is in the message of the cross, not the messenger. And several years ago, I, I was talking with a guy who was a while into his Christian life. In fact, he's a pastor today. And he came across the teaching in a drawer of the day that he gave his life to Jesus. He was like, oh, Man, this is the tape they gave me 
all those years ago. And he said, man, I was really excited to go listen to it. I thought, this thing's going to be just an awesome message. I can maybe preach it someday because, you know, it, it's got to be great. It took me from hev- hell to heaven, from sinner to saint. I mean, it just radically changed my life. And I remember sitting there and just feeling like, you know, God himself was speaking to me the whole time. He put it in. He's like, man, it was average, if that. I mean, not that great of a speaker, not that special of a message in any real human way. But what he realized is, man, the power of God changed my life that day through the simple teaching of God's word. And so there's two types of people. There's worldly people who are not able to understand the things of God, except there's one thing of God that they can understand, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, God's given people the ability, even blind, even deaf, even dead in sin, there's one thing they can hear, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if they respond to that, they get everything else that goes with it after the fact. And so you see verse 15, spiritual people will understand the things of God in a special way. And they'll also understand the rest of the world in a different way. Verse 15, it says, He who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Again, this isn't an arrogant statement. Sometimes you hear people say, hey, only God can judge me. You know, you can't make a judgment of my immoral life. Not true. The Bible judges those things. And that's what he's saying here is the very point is that a spiritual person judges all things. Not in a critical way. There's two different words used in the Bible for this. When Jesus said judge not, he was talking about in a hypocritical, condemning, critical way. One under condemnation. But later in the exact same chapter, Matthew 7, after he said judge not, he says, but judge things. Know things, discern things. You'll be able to tell things by their fruit. You'll know the difference between right and wrong. So in the very chapter where he says, judge not, he says, but judge in a different way. Making that learning of discerning in our lives. And so that's what he's saying here. And you know what? I think about it this way. When I was saved in 1993, my mind changed on some issues, major issues. Things I had felt my entire life, literally overnight. I mean, I did not hear a message on it. I didn't have somebody tell me I needed to think this way or anything else. It was like I received Christ as my Lord and Savior and my mind changed on some things. I realized I am wrong. I have been wrong. And the way I've looked at that has been wrong my whole life. Why? Because suddenly you have the Spirit of God. You have the mind of Christ. And that is going to work on you from the inside to say, you know what? Your way isn't the right way. God's way is the right way. And I had to change some things to bring them into alignment with God's word. But God gives us the strength to do that. God's word becoming our standard. And so, because we have God's word, we're going to be able to see things differently. Because we have his spirit, we're going to be able to discern things that maybe we couldn't before. But the thing is, people are going to look at us and they're not going to understand us. That's what it's saying. They're rightly judged by no one. People look at you and say, you know, you're just Mr goody two shoes and all this kind of stuff. And you go, wait a minute. I, I, all I'm saying is that I, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I'm not a goody anything. I, that's the whole point. Well, you know, you're this way and that. And you go, people don't rightly judge Christians. The only one who can really understand them is Christ and sometimes some other Christians. I think of Pedro Carrion. He's one of the uh, young men who came out of here and went over to Bethlehem. Please don't forget about him. Continue to pray for him, but planting a church there and doing a missionary work there. And you know what? I know for sure the unbelievers in his life think he's nuts, think he's crazy. And maybe even some of the Christians in his life say, you're crazy. But you look at his life and you say, no, he's just following Christ. He's just doing what God has called him to do. And so you see in verse 16, it says, who's known the mind of the mind of the Lord that he would instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. What a wonderful place for this chapter, which talks just about the simply profound statements of the Bible. Jesus Christ and him crucified. It says, who knows the mind of God that we could tell God something he doesn't already know or instruct him? But we certainly need his instruction, and he has provided for it. He says, I've given the mind of Christ. See, how arrogant to think that we know more than God. You know, I, I, we're a vapor. I mean, come on. on a, if we really last a long time, we might make it to 100 or a little bit above. 
And God's got great seniority. You know, he's been God a long time. He's been around a long time. And you think of the book of Job. You know, that, that here Job, by the end, he was starting to say, look, if I could just talk to God and ask him some questions, I know he might be a little stumped by some of my questions. And you see at the end, God coming to Job and saying, Job, I just have a single question for you, which is, where were you? You know so much. Where were you when I created everything that you see? All these different things that you look at and that are far beyond your your uh, little puny mind. How and where were you, man? I could have used some of your consulting help. A little sarcasm on God's part. But he says to Job that, and Job kind of goes, hmm, you got a pretty good point there, God. You know what? Without God, I have no wisdom. Without God, I really don't have any insight. But with God, I have all things. That's what the Bible says. I, I have the mind of Christ available to me. I have the great and wonderful glories of God's insights available to me through the scriptures with the illumination of the spirit but you see in those things the mind of christ it's not going to puff us up in pride philippians 2 tells us what the mind of christ is it's a mind of humility and obedience one that doesn't seek our own glory but god's and so seeing the two types of wisdom well there's the world's wisdom but there's the word wisdom and i hope we Go after that one. You think of the types of spirit. Well, there's the spirit of the world, and you see that it's an opposition to God. It's specifically an opposition to Jesus. People will, will pretty much put up with God, but they don't like the whole Jesus thing. Why? Because it's saying there is one way. There's one and only one way. And there's two types of people, which is people of the world who don't receive the things of God, of which those things are foolishness to them. Or there's the people of God who embrace those things. And say, Lord, I know nothing, but you know all things. And so if you're a person of the world here tonight, maybe you are. It's a strange place to be in a church if you are. But, but you know, we, we come and we seek. And sometimes people say, I just haven't made my decision yet. You know, the spirit of the world. Well, I kind of want to go between those two things. And I enjoy what the world has to say. And I know there's a lot of other ways of thinking of things and all that, the wisdom of that. Well, let me ask you a question real quickly. How is the world's way working for you just honestly just real introspectively for just a moment how is the world's way working for you and for the people around you who are doing it see i think about it and i look back on my life and i go you know i was pretty proud of all of my insights and learning and all the rest but you know what it all those facts all that knowledge never brought me wisdom i couldn't seem to live my life i couldn't seem to love my wife i couldn't seem to do Anything that had any real meaning or lasting anything to it. You know, I went to a, a good school. And it was a, a school that, you know, I studied lots of philosophy. I read Voltaire and others, you know, that kind of stuff. I was surrounded by these incredible thinkers in the classes and great professors and all the rest. And I remember I was in a human relationships class. And the professor had been married four times and was with somebody that he wasn't married to. And it never even struck me. What am I listening to this moron for? He can't get it right in his own life. Why would I listen to him? You know, but he'd go on and on about all the theories of this and A, B, and here's the graph and all this stuff. And he couldn't seem to love the person in his life. And you see, you know, I graduated from there and, and I met my wife in, actually in graduate school there. And it, it was, a, a, you know, a place of great learning. We learned many things. But you know what? We didn't learn how to love each other somehow. We learned how to make money. But we didn't know how to live life, and I knew how to fix computers, you know, and I could do all that kind of stuff, and I was surrounded by brilliant people at my office, and all of them were miserable. They were always saying, I hate this place, I hate my life, I hate what's going on, I know, you know. And, and if there was a Christian in the place, we'd all make fun of him. Yeah, that guy's an idiot, that's all we know, you know. But <laughs> lots of knowledge, you know, again, lots of knowledge, but no wisdom, no word of God in my life, no spirit of God in my life. And when you think about that, what a great day it was when, when Lynn and I both heard a message. Same day, same message. And we had heard it many times before. In fact, we grew up in churches listening to it. But it had not changed our life because it hadn't grabbed a hold of our heart. And so you see, the person just talked about Christ and him crucified. And somehow, some way, it hit both of us in the heart on the same day, in the same moment. We didn't even know what was happening to the person next to us. 
But you know what? Everything changed from that day. Now, it's been a process, of course. There are things that are still changing. And I don't know how it happened. If, it, if I did, I would make it happen in every life of every person I've ever met because it's the best thing that has ever happened to us, and I can only thank God for it. But my life now is just a constant reminder of the fact that God's wisdom is great, and my wisdom is so limited. God's ways are so much higher than mine, and when I think I've got a plan, God's got a much, much better one. And I just leave you with an example because it's right here in my mind and so recent for me. I did go to London last week. I'm still a little jet lagged from that. I don't know whether it's day or night, but I went to London just vacation with my dad. He turned 65 this uh, next month and he just wanted to do that. And we went and had a great father sometime. But it was a nine hour flight. He was coming from Colorado. We did a, a nonstop. So we met there, you know, so I'm on the plane pretty much by myself. Now, it, not by myself, but a lot of other people, but the, including the pilot and some other folks. But <laughs> that's good. Uh, but the way British Air does it, there's no seat assignments except for 24 hours before the flight. You can get a seat assignment then, and they say it's for security reasons. I think they don't want people planning where they are and all that kind of stuff. But I had a pretty specific plan, and I was like, okay, I'm going to get in on the website, and I'm going to get an aisle seat, because I, I've traveled a ton in my life, taken a lot of long flights and all this, and I know, okay, I want toward the front so I can get in and out real quickly, bulkhead, there's extra room, all that kind of stuff, I can get up without having to ask people during the night, all that stuff. So I waited on the website, and I actually was ready to go. You know, the, the second seats were available. Exactly 24 hours, they're going to put up a sign that says, on your mark, it said, go. So I, on my mark, I said, go, really close and fast with the mouse. And I, ha, got the best seat on that plane, I thought. And so what happened, I, I, I'm trying to choose it, and I'm like checking out, and it won't let me choose it. So I, oh, man, must, someone must have got it too. So I go back for another seat, and I, it looks like I got it, tried to check out, and you know what it did? It confirmed me in the worst seat on the plane. <laughs> this is what happened. It automatically said, thank you for confirming. I said, no, that's not the seat I want. You know, and it put me in the very back, right by the window, you know, in, in a long thing. And, and I called customer service. I said, hey, uh, you know, your computer messed me up. Uh, can I change my seat? No, sorry. You know, they say it real polite with the British accent and everything, but it's still no. You know, and so they said, you can check it when you get to the airport. I go to the airport, tried to change it. Sorry, still, you know, real nice and everything. But while I'm waiting, I started talking to a couple there in the airport. And they're there and, and their whole family. And, and it turns out they're missionaries to Uganda. Okay, they're on their way, not on a mission trip. They sold everything and they're going to Uganda from Florida. You know, they're moving there. And they have two young girls and all this. And I ask them, hey, where are you sitting? You know where it turned out to be? the very same row that I was in. I sat there and I actually got a great conversation with these folks. Got to pray with them. Got to spend time with them. Nine hours. Got to, <laughs> got to play with the girls. I mean, these girls were going on another flight for another like 18 hours or something to get the whole place. And so there's young kids and the parents are under all this stress. I was able to just goof around with them, show them little magic tricks that I know and all this stuff. That just had a great time with it. I said, this was the best trip. I had so much fun. I didn't sleep. That's why I'm tired. But, you know, God's <laughs> way is so different, but it's so much better. And my little wisdom of, I'm going to get my right seat. When God frustrates that, he's like, no, I have the right seat for you. And it's going to look like the wrong seat, but it's the right one. And, and I wonder how many of us have come to that place where we say, you know what? God's way is the best way. In fact, it's the only way. And so, you know, once upon a time in my life when I heard Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, I go, that's so narrow-minded. But you know what? When I found out how empty-minded I was in life, I came to realize, you know what? I'm so glad there is a way a truth, and a life. And I'm so glad there's only one because that way I can get it right. And so God says, you know what? I'm going to come and I'm going to be the answer. I'm not just going to give you the answer. I'm not just going to be a godly man or send a godly man. God came as a man. And you know what? The, the, the simple fact is that God lived a perfect life here in the person of Jesus. And he died a sinner's death. He did what none of us could do. He paid a debt that he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And he rose again to, to uh, bring those claims to truth that nobody could deny unless they wanted to. 
but he leaves us that choice. And so, as we close out today, I just want to think about this with you. Is it foolishness in your life when you think of those things? When you look at God's word or you look at God's way, do you say, eh, foolishness? You know what the Bible says? If it's foolishness to you like that, it's a sign that a person is perishing. But when it becomes the wisdom of God, when the word of God becomes the wisdom of God, you can know, hey, I'm one of the children of God. When this becomes something that means something to you, you realize, I'm receiving spiritual things because I've received the Spirit. And so as we close out in prayer tonight, I'm just going to make it very simple tonight uh, as we try to every week. Just a, an opportunity for anyone here in this room to realize, hey, I don't just need the book. I need the author. I need the Spirit of God to illuminate my life, to change my life. The world's way is not working, and it will not work in my life. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to pray here and uh, ask the Lord to move in the room upon anyone's heart who needs it and then give you an opportunity to raise your hand to accept him if that's your decision here tonight. Father, I ask that you would do what only you can do, which is move in the hearts of the people here. And specifically, Lord, during this time, if we know you, Lord, I pray that we would have on our hearts those who don't, those who have never come to the all-important decision to accept you as Lord and Savior to open our heart and our mind and our life to you, that we might have the, the mind of Christ, the life of Christ, the Spirit of God, because it's not possible to think our way to God or be good enough for you, Lord. The only thing we can do with the free gift of salvation is receive it. And so now, with our heads still bowed, our eyes closed, if there's anyone here tonight who has not made that decision and you know you need to, all you need to do is raise your hand to acknowledge your need. I see you back here. Anybody else? I see you. Anybody else? Just acknowledge your need. I need Jesus as my Savior. I want him as my Lord. I need the wisdom of God to live my life. I've got a lot of facts, but I need that faith. Anybody else here before we end tonight? If you'll just pray with me in your heart. The Bible says... We confess with our mouth. We believe in our heart. God sees and knows your heart. Pray these words. God, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my friend. I thank you for your word which gives me great promises. And I thank you that Jesus Christ was crucified for me but didn't stay dead. Three days later, you arose to give the promise of eternal life to all who believe. And I pray for those in this room that we would all be able to follow after you fully and with great faith because you are a great God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.